Hello, my name is Rick Weinzerl. I'm a professor and extension specialist in entomology with the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. This presentation in our Beginning Farmers program, Preparing a New Generation of Illinois Fruit and Vegetable Farmers, focuses on integrated pest management. Let's start with a general definition of integrated pest management, or IPM. Note that for IPM, just as for pesticides, pests are broadly defined to include insects, mites, plant pathogens, weeds, and even wildlife. Today's discussion will not cover wildlife damage prevention, but wildlife management is included in a later presentation in class. So IPM is an approach that uses a range of practices to limit losses to pests while minimizing the environmental damage, human health risks, and dollar costs associated with pest suppression. Tactics include biological control, cultural controls, pest-resistant varieties, regulatory programs, and pesticides where they are needed and in ways that minimize their adverse effects. In this presentation, I want to encourage you to develop farm plans that minimize the likelihood of severe pest outbreaks. And I'll discuss that idea for various kinds of pests. I'll introduce and stress the importance of understanding life cycles, monitoring methods, and management practices for plant pathogens, insects, and weeds. And I'll provide examples of types of references you will want to gather so that you can build a library of resources. My intent is to help you work on a longer term goal, the development and implementation of an overall integrated pest management plan for your farm. While this presentation discusses IPM very broadly, several other classes and discussions also include aspects of IPM. Pest management was a concern in our discussions of the basics of fruit and vegetable production, variety selection, transplant production, pruning to allow air movement and spray penetration in woody fruit crops, soils and soil management, irrigation, and pesticides. We also cover insect, disease, weed, and wildlife management in individual sessions in upcoming presentations and classes. During the production season, IPM practices often focus on monitoring crops for pest problems and responding appropriately. However, integrated pest management involves much more than just scouting fields and dealing with pests. Instead, it is part of whole farm planning. As you design, plan, and revise your crop production system, minimizing pest problems to optimize yield and profits should be a key component. Crop rotations, cover crops, tillage practices, crop and landscape diversity, disease-resistant cultivars, irrigation management, pest exclusion and avoidance, pest monitoring and record keeping, and direct control practices are all involved in crop and pest management. Let's start with a discussion of plant disease management. Basic Concepts in Plant Pathology by John Hartman is a good general summary to begin with. It will be provided as a handout during our class on IPM. Dr. Hartman starts his summary by pointing out that some diseases are infectious, caused by living pathogens that infect plants, but other diseases result from non-living or abiotic causes. Ozone injury, salt injury, and nutrient deficiencies are just a few examples of non-infectious abiotic diseases. For infectious diseases, a very important concept in plant pathology is the plant disease triangle. The basic idea that infectious plant diseases develop only when three things are present simultaneously. A susceptible host plant, a pathogen that can infect that plant, and environmental conditions that allow the infection to occur. Disease management practices always attempt to alter one of these parts of the disease triangle to prevent infections. The pathogens that infect plants include fungi, bacteria, nematodes, and viruses. And management practices for specific crops and diseases 
differ for different types of pathogens. Dr. Hartman points out that for disease diagnosis, the terms symptom and sign have specific meaning. Symptoms are plant reactions to infection, such as wilt or yellowing or blight. Signs are the observable presence of the pathogen itself, fungal spores, fungal mycelia or fibers, bacterial ooze, and so on. He summarizes disease management practices under the headings avoidance, exclusion, eradication, protection, resistance, and therapy. For major diseases of the crops you grow, a key step in disease management is to understand the cycle of each in advance of growing the crop. For gray mold of strawberries and several other crops, the causal organism is a fungus in the genus Botrytis. It causes the most damage when rainfall or irrigation during bloom and fruit development allow the pathogen to grow. It infects senescing blossoms first, and infection spread from blossoms to fruit. Spores are produced on infected tissue and on plant debris, and direct infection of mature fruit can occur a few days later. Knowing that senescing blossoms are an, are an initial infection site can guide your decisions on the use of fungicides at bloom during periods of rainy weather. And understanding that infected tissues produce spores that can start new infections guides additional decisions about disease management. Gray mold of strawberries and other crops is called a polycyclic disease. Production of new inoculum, spores, in this case called conidia, on infected tissues can initiate additional infection cycles as the season progresses. Polycyclic diseases, that are also called compound interest diseases, include gray mold, powdery mildew, brown rot in stone fruits, and many other examples. In contrast, monocyclic diseases cause only one infection cycle per crop season, although multiple cycles can occur in one year if succession plantings of vegetables provide a new crop for infection later in the summer or fall in the same ground or on the same plot. Examples of monocyclic diseases or simple interest diseases include root or crown infections caused by fungi in the genus Fusarium or other soilborne pathogens, and peach leaf curl of peaches. Examples of Dr. Hartman's summary of disease management practices are listed in this slide. To avoid pathogens, crops may be grown in regions where certain pathogens do not occur or are rare. For example, several vegetable seed crops are grown in the arid west where key bacterial diseases do not occur, and that produces disease-free seeds. Crops susceptible to aphid-borne viruses are grown early in the season, when aphid populations are usually lighter. Crops susceptible to root rots are not grown on low, wet, poorly drained soils, and rotations are designed to place susceptible crops in fields where specific pathogen levels have declined in the absence of crops in that plant family. Seed and plant certification programs, quarantines on the movement of infected plant materials, and the use of row covers to exclude insect vectors of viruses are all examples of exclusion of plant, pa plant pathogens from fields. Eradication of pathogens, or more accurately the reduction of inoculum to very low levels, is the goal of destroying or burying or effectively composting crop residues and of crop rotations so that soil-borne pathogens die off or are attacked by other soil microorganisms during the years when susceptible crops are not grown in those fields. Fungicides and bactericides may be applied to plants to protect them in, from infection, and high tunnels and greenhouses protect plants from rainfall that may be necessary for infection. Using disease-resistant varieties is often a key step in disease management for fruits and vegetables. Therapy the killing off of an infection within a plant is usually not an option, though hot water treatment of some vegetable seeds is an example of this approach. Often the realistic goal of plant disease management is to slow the progress of disease development in a crop or field. 
Plant pathologists often describe disease development by measuring the area under the disease progress curve. If disease development can be delayed, especially for diseases that do not alter the appearance of fruits and vegetables, profitable yields can be harvested even if many plants are infected by the end of the season. The graphs in this slide illustrate the value of using resistance in potatoes to reduce losses to late blight. The details are not the point of showing this slide, but the idea that resistance, habitat modification, fungicides, and other management practices can slow disease development and protect yields is a very important one, and the basis for plant disease management in general. We grow a great number of vegetable and fruit crops in Illinois, and each is susceptible to several common and damaging diseases. We will cover some specific disease management practices later in this course, and see several during our field and farm visits as well. But the breadth of the topic of plant disease management in vegetables and fruits is much greater than we can cover in our presentations. Cornell's Vegetable MD site provides many useful fact sheets, illustrations, and management recommendations for a wide variety of vegetable crops. Similarly, the Midwest Small Fruit Pest Management Handbook and the Midwest Tree Fruit Pest Management Handbook are available online and in print. They provide background information on disease cycles and cultural control practices for many common diseases. In many instances, you will want to use Google or a similar search engine to look for disease identification and disease management guides for specific crops. The two tomato disease publications listed here are examples of the kind of information available online. In many instances, the online references that will be most valuable are those from .edu or .gov domains, publications produced by university research and extension personnel and by USDA researchers. Good references can be found from private sources at .com and .org domains, but some of these also advocate for certain commercial products or contain inaccurate or unsubstantiated claims. So be a little careful as an information consumer. Although online and printed disease identification guides can be very helpful, it's often necessary to send samples of diseased plants to a lab where a definitive diagnosis can be done. The University of Illinois Plant Clinic provides such a service for a small fee. The Plant Clinic website provides information on its services and fees and on how to prepare and send samples. Planning and carrying out disease management practices that can resolve a problem or avoid it in the future depend on correct diagnosis because practices that reduce losses to one disease may not be at all effective for another whose symptoms may look quite similar. Paying a small fee for an accurate identification and diagnosis is almost always a good investment. Let's turn to insect pest management. Two general sources of information on insects and pest management for fruits and vegetables in the Midwest are the website for the University of Illinois Introduction to Applied Entomology course and the book Garden Insects of North America. The early portion of the introductory entomology course covers insect biology in broad categories of classification and identification. The later portion of the course focuses on pest management. The guide to the lab on fruit and vegetable insects is available at the link on this slide. An excellent reference on common insects in gardens, crops, and landscapes is Garden Insects of North America by Whitney Cranshaw. It contains over 1,400 illustrations and sells for $29.95, and often lots less on Amazon. Some key things to consider in insect pest management, in addition to accurate identification of the insects that occur in crops, include their life cycles. Some develop through just one generation each year. Others have multiple generations per year and a few take more than one year to develop from egg to adult. This characteristic influences management practices. Their metamorphosis. Those with gradual metamorphosis, or change in form, look pretty much the same in immature and adult stages, 
and live in the same habitat, while those with complete metamorphosis change form from the immature to the adult stage, caterpillars to moths, grubs to beetles, maggots to flies. Their mouthparts are feeding structures. Those with a piercing, needle-like stylet suck plant fluids from host plants and cannot lead ho eat holes in leaves. If an insect feeds on leaves and results in holes or missing tissue, it's one that instead has chewing mandibles, like beetles, caterpillars, grasshoppers, and so on. And whenever you describe an insect to someone in hopes of learning what it is, be sure to be able to describe the wings, how many and what shape, and the legs, how many, are they special in any way, like modified for jumping, digging, or something like that. Insects develop faster at warmer temperatures, so the timing of their occurrence is sometimes predicted using phenology models and degree days. They may be direct or indirect pests. Direct pests feed on parts of the crops that we intend to harvest, for example, the fruits of apples and tomatoes. Indirect pests feed on supporting parts, often roots, stems, and leaves, though in some cases these parts are what we harvest. Think of beets, carrots, and spinach. And some pest populations explode in numbers after insecticides are used to control other pests that kill the natural enemies of the new pest as well. These are called secondary pests, and aphids and mites often fall into this category. For identification of pest insects in specific crops, fact sheets and specialized publications are useful. The Penn State University and the University of Minnesota fact sheets cited in this slide are very useful. So is the Vegetable Insect Management book published by Meister Press. For fruit insects, the first reference listed in this slide is from the University of Minnesota. The second is more extensive but less focused on the Midwest. The pocket guides for apples and stone fruits focus on how to look for and assess densities of pest problems common in tree fruits. The Midwest Pest Management Handbooks for small fruits and tree fruits were recommended earlier in conjunction with plant disease management as well. An underlying idea for insect pest management and for management of diseases, weeds, and wildlife is that low densities of pests may cost more to control than the value of the loss that they will cause. If the cost of controlling a pest is greater than the losses the pest will cause, then the control action is not profitable. Where control actions, often pesticide applications, can be effective if they are initiated after scouting or monitoring indicates that the problem is worth treating, research on relationships between pest density and profit loss can be used to set thresholds. How many insects, weeds, nematodes, or infected plants per standard sample warrants some sort of control. The idea can become quite complicated when the value of the crop, standards for cosmetic appearance, and the costs of control steps differ within or over seasons. But a valuable take-home message is that pest management practices do not need to aim for total elimination of pests to be adequately effective. Thresholds, published in a number of pest management references, are guidelines for pest densities that should trigger direct control actions. So if estimates of Pest density allow decisions on whether or not controls are warranted, what kinds of monitoring or scouting tools are needed. The most common tools and devices are a hand lens, not a big magnifying glass because the distortion associated with lenses of that diameter limit their effective magnification. So buy a small lens and learn how to use it. A beading tray or a ground cloth or any kind of light-colored surface that can be held or placed under plants so that when the plants are struck or shaken, the insects that drop from the plants end up on the tray or cloth. Pheromone traps are traps that are baited with lures that attract certain pest species. And a sweep net may be used in low-growing crops. You'll see examples of all these devices in our classes and in our farm visits. A reliable supplier of monitoring tools in the Midwest is Great Lakes IPM. Pheromones are chemicals that insects use for within-species communication. 
In pest management, pheromones that female moths use to attract males are used most commonly for monitoring the time of occurrence and the relative density of pest populations. These synthetic versions of natural pheromones do not attract females or lead to an increase in damage in the areas around traps. Although pheromones for many species have been identified, pheromone traps and similar traps that do not use pheromones as lures are used for a relatively small number of insect pests. For new growers, start with using traps to monitor flights of codling moth, apple maggot, and oriental fruit moth and apples. Oriental fruit moth and lesser and greater peach tree borers and peaches, spotted wing drosophila in several fruit crops, and corn earworm around sweet corn and tomatoes. Keeping records of counts is essential for later decision making. And remember that these traps are used to monitor populations, not reduce them. We almost never recommend the use of any kinds of traps to reduce populations of insects outdoors, with very few exceptions. And we definitely do not recommend the use of Japanese beetle traps to reduce populations of that insect. They do not work as advertised. The vast majority of insects are not pests, and many are directly beneficial as pollinators and as natural enemies, predators and parasites of pests. The first four references in this slide include general information on identifying natural enemies and encouraging their populations. The fifth and sixth listings provide recommendations of specific plants that attract and support various predaceous and parasitic insects. Realize that many predaceous and parasitic insects feed on pollen and nectar from small flowers, as well as on other insects. In outdoor production, the purchase and release of natural enemies from insectaries rarely provides meaningful benefits but buying and releasing predators and parasites for aphids, whiteflies, thrips, and mites in greenhouses or high tunnels can be effective in some instances. In many ways, the approaches used to limit crop losses to insects are very similar to those used in disease management. Early plantings of several vegetable crops may be used to avoid late season pests, such as earworms, fall armyworms, and aphids. Conversely, later plantings may avoid early season seed and root maggots. Rotations are less effective against insects that are highly mobile in the relevant stage of their life cycle, but they are valuable against several important pests such as Colorado potato beetle and squash bug. Planting insect-free transplants is important, and using infested transplants occasionally results in diamondback moth infestations in cabbage family crops. Screening in greenhouses and row covers in fields can provide effective exclusion of many pests. Crop destruction after harvest prevents further survival and reproduction for host-specific insects, such as squash bug and squash vine borer. Insecticides and miticides protect plants by killing the pests in treated fields. There are fewer examples of insect-resistant cultivars than disease-resistant cultivars, but thrips-resistant onion and cabbage cultivars are available, and Bt sweet corn cultivars kill caterpillars that otherwise infest stalks and ears. Weed management is also part of IPM. At an overview level, important considerations are the types of weeds, their life cycles, specific identification, and cultural, mechanical, and chemical control. Remember that the reasons for weed management include reducing their impact as competitors for water, light, and nutrients, limiting the buildup of the seed, weed seed bank in the soil, and reducing their contributions to the survival and impacts of crop pathogens and insects. Weeds are broadly classified as grasses, monocots, broadleaf weeds, dicots, and sedges. These groups of plants respond differently to physical practices and herbicides that might be used in attempts to control them. Weeds are also described by the seasonality of their life cycles and the duration of their life cycles. Annual weeds complete their life cycle from seed germination through vegetative growth, flowering, and seed production in one year. Summer annuals such as water hemp and giant foxtail germinate from seed in the spring or summer, 
then grow and produce seed later in the summer or fall of the same year. Henbit and chickweed are examples of winter annuals that germinate from seed in the late summer or fall, grow vegetatively before cold temperatures that then prevent further growth, but then they resume growth and produce seed in the spring or early summer of the next year. Biennial weeds such as wild carrot, bull thistle, and common mullen require two growing seasons to complete their life cycles. They emerge from seeds in the spring or summer, grow vegetatively in the first season, survive the winter, and flower and produce seeds the next growing season. And as the name implies, perennial weeds live for two years or more, many for several years, regrowing from roots each year. Dandelions, Johnson grass, and wild garlic are perennials. Different weeds with different life cycles are favored in different cropping systems and those that are very similar to the crop may be the most difficult to control. As with disease management and insect management, identifying the weeds that infest different portions of your farm is a key step in planning management practices. Herbicides that are effective against a certain weed may not be effective against another, and even the cultural or mechanical practices you might use may differ in their value against different weed species. The references listed here are among many good resources on weed identification. References that include keys and photos for identification of weed seedlings can be especially valuable where selection of an herbicide may depend on weed species identification at a very early stage. Weed management involves lots of different factors. Delaying planting may allow removal of an early flush of weeds with light tillage or a burned down herbicide before planting. Planting early may allow crop establishment and growth before summer annual weeds germinate and compete for resources. Higher seeding rates and close row spacings can lead to quick development of a crop canopy that shades out weed seedlings. Cover crops may produce allelopathic chemicals that inhibit weed growth or outcompete weeds during periods between crops, and that prevents weeds from producing seeds that would add to the soil weed seed bank. Fertilizing and watering only within rows on raised beds covered with plastic mulch support the crop but not the weeds between rows. Crop rotations allow for different weed control practices at different times in different crops on the same plot of land and mulches of many types are used in vegetable and fruit production systems. We always advise against over tillage because of the negative effects of tillage on soil structure, but tillage is often a key step in weed management in vegetable crops. Pre-plant tillage removes weed seedlings, prepares a seed bed that allows rapid germination of new crops. Row cultivation is also a standard practice in some crops, and everyone is familiar with hoeing, pulling, and mowing. Flaming, burning, steaming, and solarizing all can play roles in certain circumstances. Recommendations for herbicide use for weed control and fruits and vegetables are presented in publications that I'll list in a few minutes, and in fact herbicides can be used effectively and safely as part of weed control programs on small farms. However, herbicides are not as dominant a part of weed control in specialty crops as they are in large-scale agronomic crops. One reason is that herbicide development and registration is very expensive, and the potential sales that would allow companies to recoup investment costs are much lower in specialty crops. Additionally, as I said earlier, drift from some products across even a short distance and persistence in soil for other chemicals complicate the use of herbicides in diverse small plantings and complex crop rotations that characterize many fruit and vegetable farms. We all know that insects develop faster in warmer weather and that most plant diseases progress more rapidly in warm wet weather. And predictive models based on temperature, leaf wetness, and other factors are available to guide monitoring and control programs for insects and diseases. Some are available at no charge online. Others require purchase of weather monitoring equipment 
and computer software. Even if you're not ready for such investments, it's never too soon to read about and learn about these programs that can help refine decisions on pesticide application. A common recommendation for all aspects of integrated pest management is to read relevant newsletters that cover fruit and vegetable production. These newsletters from Illinois, Purdue in Indiana, and Ohio are especially useful for Illinois growers. The University of Illinois Extension's Local Food Systems and Small Farms team has organized and delivered numerous webinars that are especially useful for new growers, and these discussions are archived and available. Several of these webinars cover insect disease and weed management in fruits and vegetables, and some are specifically focused on organic production. Use the link presented in this slide to access these archived webinars. For the main crops you plan to grow, it's always good to locate and read one or two good references on pest management before you start growing the crop. These are a few examples that cover sweet corn, tomatoes, peppers, apples, and cucurbits. It's also really important to monitor fields or plots regularly, or at least once weekly. The monitoring process is called scouting and it requires specific approaches to looking for and assessing different insects, diseases, and weeds. The links listed on this slide provide forms to use when scouting specific crops. These are just examples, and in fact we use a single form for scouting a number of different crops at the Sustainable Student Farm at campus at Urbana. The most important things are to, one, observe crops closely, and two, record what you see with numbers that indicate how many, how much. After you design your farm plan to minimize pest risks, you scout to determine what problems still arise, and you find you need to do something to reduce the losses that insects, diseases, or weeds will cause, then the same references that I mentioned in the discussion about pesticides provide summaries of what works against what problems. The Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide and the Cornell Production Guide for Organic Apples are good resources. For grapes and small fruits such as brambles, blueberries, and strawberries, the annually revised Midwest Small Fruit and Grape Spray Guide and the Cornell Organic Production Guides for certain small fruits provide spray recommendations for specific pests. And for vegetables, the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide and Cornell's Organic Production Guides are again the good resources. So to summarize, this presentation has provided some general information to help you consider farm plans that minimize the likelihood of severe pest outbreaks. And that theme is reported for all kinds of pests, not just insects. To understand the basics of disease cycles, monitoring and management, insect life cycles, monitoring and management, and weed life cycles, monitoring and management. I've stressed that you should find key references on identification, monitoring, and management for individual crops so that you can build a, li a library of resources. I showed examples for sweet corn, tomatoes, and apples, but you'll need to find similar materials for a number of other crops as well. Upcoming presentations and discussions will discuss specifics of weed, plant disease, insect, and wildlife management in fruit and vegetable production, and will help to build those resources and reference lists as we do that. So that's it for an introduction to integrated pest management.